Okay, everybody. Um, I'm just uh, sorting myself out. Um, I've got two computers running tonight, so uh, hopefully we won't have the errors that we had last week. Um, I mean, the idea is to um, have about 45 minutes of chat. Um, sorry, uh, have about 45 minutes of chat, and uh, and then we'll have a bit of a uh, we'll have some uh, questions and answers. Um, now I've got Phil and uh, John. Uh, hopefully joining us uh, this evening. Uh, Kate's uh, a co-host uh, and Phil's recording the uh, thing to go out on uh, YouTube. And um, after about 45 minutes, um, then, then we will have a question and answer session. One of the comments that we had last week was that uh, um, maybe it went on a bit too long. It's now 15, which actually I don't think is too bad. Um, but um, We'll try to keep it no longer than that. And so hopefully what we'll do is, is flash through the uh, slides and uh, get the salient points. And because the whole point is, is for you to sort of, um, you know, try and uh, ask questions and, and not be intimidated by, by you know, uh, uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question because uh, I was actually having a chat with, um, with Tony Sperling this morning. And, and to a certain degree, you know, one of the things that Tony was saying was that, you know, we're presenting these really fantastic images that can be quite intimidating of the mountains and all this sort of stuff, and it puts people off. Well, it's not like that. What, what happens is, is that you take baby steps and you go into the mountains, and over the years, you get experience and you build up. Um, you know, the fact is, is that when you're looking at some spectacular scenery, you can actually have a feel very close to you and all, all, all the rest of it. And it just, it, it appears intimidating. And actually, it's not um, if you take the appropriate measures. So I, I did think about that and I thought, are we overcomplicating it? And hopefully tonight we'll try and, um, we'll try and uh, make it uh, as, as, it's not as esoteric that you know you've got to be a brilliant pilot to do it because you, you don't. It's 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 actually all quite simple. Anyway, what we'll do is uh, we'll start off with a review of what we did uh, last week, which was why we do it, uh, basically because it's bloody good fun. We spoke about the required tools and an introduction to the right, right mindset because the the important thing is basically to be to build you know to have confidence. Once you've got confidence of flying in the flatlands, then you can build up your confidence to uh, uh, go, you know, take the steps to go into the mountains. And Kate and John discussed, uh, um, you know, a nice triangle they did a few years ago. And, um, and then we went on to uh, setting personal boundaries. And that depends upon your level of confidence and experience. And basically, as you gain more experience, you, you, you extend your boundaries. And lastly, most important, or the other thing that we discussed was the field landing uh, database. So the most important rule uh, that we had was always to be within safe gliding distance of the field. Uh, and that's basically where we got to uh, last time. Okay, now just to take this picture, for example, it's, um, it's taken around pit lockery which is not far up the A9. And there's tons of field in the valley. And what we do is we're looking east down towards Montrose. And I'd done a flight that day, that was back in May last year, where I'd gone up, uh, you know, basically um, up into the Spey Valley. And it was getting showery up there. And uh, I decided to come back uh, to go and play with the convergence zone. That I knew was going to come in around uh, Edsel and Fetakern. I knew it was going to come in in the afternoon and I want to go and play in it. And you can see the conditions, what we've got about a 6,000 foot cloud base. And this is at Pit Lockery. And it looks intimidating, but it's not because you've got all the fields in the valley. And from this height, you can glide all the way across the hills down towards uh, Blair Gowrie uh, and up that way. And you've got sufficient height to get into the flatlands. So, you know, there's an example, and that literally is, is very easy to get into once you've got up to Dunkeld. 
because the difficult bit is getting across, um, you know, uh, across Perth and so on, because it's wetter there normally. Uh, and the thermals, although they can be good, are not as good as what you'll have in the mountains. So there's an example of, uh, 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 of local soaring in effect. So we're talking about becoming a good pilot. Um, so what is, what is a good pilot? Well, a good pilot can be a good pilot having gone solo, as long as he's flying within his limitations, he's making the right decisions. You know, you don't have to be experienced to be a good pilot. It's a matter of the right attitude. Um, you know, it really is a matter of the right mindset, setting yourself the appropriate goals and the appropriate boundaries. And so, again, when you talk to fly, what it's a matter of, what your instructors are telling you, is you're developing good habits, like, you know, your cockpit checks, eventualities before you take off, being able to spot land. So developing good habits, I mean, it's a form of planning, which we talk about, because planning is a very esoteric term, but Really, all it is, is, is thinking ahead. That's what planning is. And so, for example, when you go on a soaring flight, you plan ahead, you look at the weather and so on. And these are all habits. And if you just get into the habit of, of preparing yourself for a flight, it's not something that you just do instantly, although you can do that if you're experienced, um, but just getting into the right habits. Now, situational awareness, um, being aware of what's going around you. Now, I'm just going to read um, what the definition is of situational awareness, which I think is really worth thinking about. And what situational awareness is, is about what it's defined as is the perception of environmental elements and events with respect to time or space. So what's going on about you? Your comprehension of their meaning. So that is what we think is going on. And their projection and, and the projection of their future status. And that means what we think is going to happen. Now, that's a real thing to think about, because when we're flying an aircraft, one of the things you have to say to yourself is what is actually going on, because that is different to what we think is going on. It's your perception. And then we also think, we project into the future and we say, what do we think is going to happen? Now, I'll be honest, I have a tendency to catastrophize, right? I have a situation, I think, oh God, it's bad and you project into the future, you think it's gonna get worse. Well, that's not necessarily true. And it is a matter, It's a, this I find a, a fault of myself. I have to sort of sit there and go, what is actually going on? It's when I flew aircraft, and when you're in an emergency situation, an aircraft, you have to sit there and actually sit on your hands and say, what do I see? What do I actually see? And then you can project into the future, if you see my point, and you carry out the appropriate drills. But coming back to it, when we're looking at soaring, what is actually going on? Is the day deteriorating or is it just temporary? What you think is going on and what you think is going to happen. And as you get more experience, you become more confident in what's going on. Any, any comments on that at all, Kate, as an instructor? Sorry, my, my internet is dropping out a little bit, but I thought I heard absolutely spot on, yes. Um, yeah, Okay. sorry, Wait. you carry on, son. My, my internet yeah. is a little okay. bit flaky. Right, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right, okay, so, Situational awareness, it's, it's, it's really good. And what tends to happen carrying that on is that when we get under stress, our situational awareness 
tends to reduce. And when we're coming into, it's like, for example, on your early cross countries, breaking that bond from not being within gliding distance of the field, that is stressful and you overcome it and you acquire knowledge and experience. And so the stress becomes less. And so that carries on if, uh, you know, through experience. So it's really worth thinking about is situational awareness. Got a lot to get through tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna try and speed up a wee bit. So again, it's always, when we talk about having a plan, it's not something that you sort of write down on a piece of paper and all this sort of stuff, right? It's a matter of turning around and saying, well, what am I gonna do in the next? You see, there's, there, you know, planning, there's long-term planning and there's short-term planning. And the dividing lines are actually, there isn't any dividing line because when does a long-term plan become a short-term plan? Because, you know, you, it, it varies. You, you mustn't think in blocks. It's, it's a sort of a, a scale. And, um, but we can sort of break it down into long-term planning. Well, long-term plan is preparing for the flight. And we spoke about that last week. Short-term planning, well, there, you're turning around and saying, what's going on now? What do I think is going on now? And what do you think is going to happen in the future? And you make decisions based upon that. But stress does have an influence. So that all comes back to having the right mindset. And it's, you know, you look at it in a logical fashion and you look at a flight and you sort of say, you know, when you look at the weather and all this sort of stuff, you say, is the day going to deteriorate at some point? What am I going to do? You know, so on and so on. Um, so we've spoken about long term planning before, getting the equipment ready, all the rest of it. The short term planning, well, you know, it's it's a matter of when you're in the aircraft assessing the conditions and 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 deciding what what you want to do. Um, so, as I say, the preparation, gaining knowledge, and preparing for a soaring flight. One of the good things from long term planning is, you know, I spoke about last week. There's always cliques, and. Um, And my clique is, uh, the clique I'm in is, is John Williams, Tony Sperling, um, Colin Hamilton, uh, you, uh, Phil Dolan, and, and we end up chatting about things. You know, there's others as well. Uh, and we end up chatting about, so everybody has a clique um, and, you, you do it, you do it naturally. Uh, we've got the early morning group. That's a form of a clique, if you see my point. I put one out today for, for wave soaring on Thursday. And there will be various people within the early morning group who will be having a chat themselves. Um, and, you know, the, you know, Just F in Do It group has just started up. And, um, and that's basically for early solo pilots or, or aspiring cross-country pilots, should I say. And, and basically the idea is you chat amongst themselves and you kick things about and you form a group of, of like-minded in, individuals. And, and it's amazing. Like, I mean, for example, I had a long chat with, with Tony today and, and, and he presented some, some viewpoints to me, which I found very interesting. And then basically again, you know, you're looking at the weather and the no terms and forming a plan from that point of view. And that depends on, on you know, you look at it weeks in advance, but then you have a good look on the, on, actually on the morning if you need to. Right. So I love this picture because this guy, I love it because this is where your situational awareness has gone right down the plug hole. Uh, you are not, you're sitting there completely shit scared wondering what's going on and basically you're overwhelmed at this point. I would say there's been about, mm, I'll be honest about it, it's been about three times I've been completely overwhelmed in, in an aircraft 
I mean, you could have lifted my arm up and I would not have had the sense to bring it down. Um, I remember that day because I got lost on a cross country. But what you do is ultimately you, you just have to sit on your hands and, um, and get a mental grip. You know, what do I see? What can I do? Or what's going to happen in the future if I don't do something? I mean, in this case, if the guy's in a spin, well, it's going to be opposite rudder, stick forward to the rotation stops. And you just have to sit there, what am I going to do? And um, stress is a big thing because what happens um, as you get stressful, as you get more stress, you tend to become fixated and you tend to have tunnel vision. And what you actually have to do is sit back and sort of to a certain degree detach yourself. And say, <laughs> Hang on, let's stand back a bit. And what do I actually see what's going on? Um, now, that doesn't just apply to gliding, you know, but like, for example, when you're getting low and you're sitting there, shall I carry on soaring or shall I decide to land? You've got to be quite clear in your thinking, which is what I spoke about last week. And can I, uh, can I just jump in on something there? <clears throat> yeah, go on, Phil. Just, uh, just uh, um, many years ago, I was at a place where they were having these sort of conversations and one of the instructors came up with a good plan and it's a, another acronym, I'm afraid, but it's SOAR, S-O-A-R, which is very appropriate for glider pilots, of course. And <clears throat> he said that he always went through situation, you know, what's going on, what's actually happening right now, O stood for options. What can I do? Should I land? Should I try another thermal? Should I do something? A stood for action. So we've got these options, go do something. And then R stood for review. Was that thermal better than the last one? Or whatever. Am I climbing? No. You know, do I need to land? So it was SOAR, S-O-A-R, situation, options, action, review. And uh, that was that a... There are a few timescales, you know, from, from minutes to hours. Do we actually teach anything like that in, in instructing? This was just on cross country, was it, Phil? Yeah, it was, it was, it was more on cross country, you know, where you, can have all these different where you can have all these different factors coming into play, you know, such as the weather, how much daylight is the left, am I really tired, am I really low, am I close to fields, that sort of stuff, you know, where the, the interaction is a bit more complex. And so it was, you know, if you get into real pickle, park up, assess the situation and go through that little... Yeah. That's very good. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, in, in commercial aviation, we used to use a thing called DODAR, which I think people have heard about. It's diagnosis, options, decide, allocate, review. And, um, but it, the, the, I think that one actually is very good for gliding. The, the thing is, what you're doing there is when you're in the shit, you've got to have something, you've got to have a handle to stick your hat on, if you see my point, or a peg to stick your hat on. Because when you get into a situation where you don't know what's going on, you've got to, you've got to sort of say, shit, I've got to sort myself out. Situation, you know, um, uh, options, action, and... and uh, uh, review or whatever, you know, you know, forgive me, Philip, I didn't get that quite right. But that is what we talk about with planning, where you turn around, and this is about getting the right, you know, the right, uh, the right confidence, uh, you know, getting the confidence to be able to handle high stress situations. Because it comes to the next point, which is addressing one's fears. And I'll, I'll give you an, uh, uh, one that I fear. The one I fear more than anything else is the novel situation. I really fear that one because I don't have the experience. If it's novel, if it's new, I don't have the experience to be able to, to, to go back on and I have to think on my feet. And that is actually, I reckon, the most difficult. What would you think about that one? Any comments on that? Okay, we'll move on. Um, 
So again, coming back to confidence, and it's one of the things I used to tell my students when I was doing ground studies for the ATPL. I mean, I, I, I know that uh, Steve Clinston uh, was, was going on the other day about uh, um, doing his uh, PPL training and he, he's hating the NAB wheel, you know, the CRP. And um, the things I always used to tell my students is what you should do, you, at the end of the day, <laughs> you don't have a choice about it. If you're going to be any good, there's going to be certain bits that you're not good at. And there's no point bemoaning the fact that you're no good at it. What you do, and what I used to tell my students, is you practice your bad at what you're bad at until you're good at, at it. There's no point practicing what you're good at because you're good at it. You know, so, you know, if you can really center on a thermal, right? But you, you, you're crap at navigation, right? Well, that's not a lot of good. So you practice your navigation until you're good at it. And so, and so you make what's really bad your actual good bit. And then that's the way that you become a good pilot. Now, we spoke about field landings last week. And I don't know if Kate's, you know, you're going to be able to do this, Kate. Um, now, as I say, this is at Glen Lyon, uh, which is just off the A9 again. Uh, and again, it looks intimidating, but it's not because there's fields, there's fields uh, in, in, there's fields in, in, in the center there, but you've got fields back at, back at the A9. So what I'll do is I'll bring up that, well, the point I'm getting to is, is that what we do for field landings or what we can do to practice field landings is to do it on the airfield. Um, Kate, do you want to I put up the first slide, which is uh, um, uh, people wanting to uh, you know practice field landings on the airfield. So we look at we look at the south field. Um, do you want to comment about these these, Kate, and tell me when to bring the next slide up? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I apologize in advance. My internet is really flaky, so if this doesn't work, just tell me and I'll I'll shut up. Yeah. But um, yeah, everyone will have done that, that um, landing into the south field, I'm sure. Um, it, it's very good practice that if you look at the compare size of the south field with any of the fields around, you can see it's pretty small. So if you can land comfortably in that, you should be able to land in whatever fields are available. Um, do you want to look at the, the other one, Stant? Okay. Oops, hang on a minute. Oh, you can just... hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, but I've just got a wee problem with my. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yep. Uh, I'll just uh, just give me a bit a minute. Right. Hang on, it's not working. Let me just do this. Right. Sorry, I've got to go back one. Yeah, that's that one. So that, that's the south field is one that people will have used a lot. This one is one that we quite often use in bronze preparation and training. Um, uh, people may be less familiar with it, so for that reason, it's a good one to try. Uh, it's coming in. It, it, you, basically, you've got options for different wind directions. So in the southeasterly, this one is good. Um, you come in between the trees on the um, on the north side of the field, um, and all of these are planned so that they're pretty safe. You've always got an overrun if you do get it wrong. If you're not sure about it, then do it with an instructor first. And the the circuit patterns are just notional. Um, you'll notice that they are all identical. I simply drew one and then uh, copied it each time. You, you set up the circuit that is appropriate. And obviously, if you are doing this, then make sure that people can hear you, um, that you give radio calls to explain what you're doing, um, because you will, uh, you'll need to fit in with other traffic. You wouldn't do this except on a, a southerly day. So um, yeah, you know, obvious okay. precautions. All right, move on to the next one. I like That's another this one. one that, um, again, we, we use this in training as well. The back strip is a little bit undulating and you have to time your touchdown quite well. Um, the, the idea is to uh, 
to land over the first hump and at the beginning of the slope up. If you go and look at that part of the field, you'll see what I mean. And again, you can do a, either a left hand or a right hand circuit to that one. And it's one that we quite often use in, in bronze preparation. And it will give you, you know, if you can set up a circuit to a completely unfamiliar bit of the airfield like this, it should give you a bit of confidence for doing that for a real field. Okay, and finally, and finally, this one, people people will probably be familiar with landing across the north field where we quite often do. And again, the, the circuit is notional. But notice that I have put in a left-hand circuit. I, th I think it's John Henry who always used to recommend that in southerly winds, a left-hand circuit um, across here is actually much more comfortable because you're... Um, you're not in nearly so much of the turbulence behind Bernati and, and indeed the trees on the airfield. So it's um, it's a less turbulent circuit. Obviously be aware of other traffic and you know make sure that people understand what you're doing. Let the duty instructor know that you're doing this sort of circuit practice and give good radio calls. Good. Um, just jump in as well, just to, <clears throat> just to remind everybody what I said last week is that the, the dimensions of the fields in the outlanding database are similar to and occasionally shorter than the south field so all of these landing runs are very appropriate for the types of fields you'll find in the landing database uh, um can you guys hear me hello that's yes. only yeah um just one other point that something was raised last time was the idea of practicing um, precision approaches into our fields um, obviously, we're all guilty of the sort of dump it on smoothly, somewhere dry approach. Um, um, but something I used to do when I was a full time instructor at the club was to put down a fluorescent rectangle um, on the, you know, the early somewhere in from whichever runway you're using from the threshold and get students to round out over that, try to round out over that marker. And I, I just wondered sometimes whether it would be possible, um, you know, mowing and aeration aside, um, for us to have some kind of permanent or semi-permanent markers on the approach or the beginning of each runway, if you know what I mean, um, as one might at an airfield, you know, at an airfield, uh, a power airfield or whatever. Um, I wonder if that was a possibility. I'm not thoroughly familiar, familiar with the options. I know a concrete slab might be a bit difficult in terms of air, the air rating equipment. Uh, and some people know a lot more about it than I do. But I think that might be a quite a useful thing to have, because certainly I would appreciate uh, the ability to practice that every time I come in in a variety of conditions. I don't know about other people. That, I think that's a very good point. Chris um, Robinson built... Um some fluorescent markers and even though they were quite big on the ground they were surprisingly difficult to see yeah. from circuit height yeah um if anyone has good ideas about a really robust way of doing this mm -hmm. um i think we'd be interested right okay can i finish off on on that one one point that i've made is uh when we look at this lot is that if we look at the south field there and look at these fields here they're huge they're huge compared to what we're landing in. So if you can land in these areas that uh, Kate and uh, Tony have been talking about, then really there's there's not a lot of issues. I mean, even look at that one. I know that uh, last year the, uh, the Boshan landed in this field when it couldn't get back from the North Ridge. Um, so just look at the fields around you and compare them to the size. And actually, I mean, there was a thing a few years ago where it might be an idea to laugh you know, with the club's uh, authorization to ask a local farmer if I can go and land in the field. We, I mean, we've got a club member, George Turnbull, and he's quite happy in the past, I don't know if he would be now, uh, to allow gliders to come and land in his field. And it, it's, if you're having to de-rig the glider, I mean, the club could approach possibly turf it on a nice day and say, can we land in the field? But it's not being used or, be, you know, uh, for grass growing. We don't want to their grass or anything like that but uh, they, they may allow us. We'll move on from there because, but the, the important thing is, is to practice it on this field. So we've, got the, we've got the ability to do it and just practice it. Sam, can I raise just one point before we go from this? Yeah. 
Yep. Again, reference looking at this, I assume it's Google Earth image of our field and the size of the south field. Um, as I've shown elsewhere, uh, it's possible to take a tour around the highlands using, in my case, I've got an Android phone using Google Earth on, on the Maps facility and to look at the fields that are available and to put them against, you know, if you like, a template of the South Field. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you haven't got time or, or, or the diligence to drive around all of those fields, um, you can actually do the tour at home on a rainy day, you know, a rainy night. Well, uh, I was talking to look somebody. At what's, look at what's there and you see there's a lot more there than you imagine. I, I was talking to somebody uh, last week that's doing that actually now. I can't remember his name, unfortunately. Got to move on because we've got about another 15, 20 minutes to go. And um, uh, there's a slide that's really quite important. Um, I spoke about it last week. Um, this is our playground. Uh, we've got a boy, correction. We've got, um, we've got uh, Feshi, which I think is the best soaring, uh, thermal soaring site, followed by Boyne. And then there's ourselves. And there's Easterton right to the top of the map. Um, now, I spoke about the flat areas, and we'll be talking about that later on. But if I can just move to this this uh, slide, because I think it's it's quite an important um, uh, thingy, because we talk about stepping stones for wave soaring, well, it's exactly the same for thermal soaring. I and mean, what you do when you go on a cross-country flight is you've got your thermal. So you climb in your thermal, you're going down a route, you look for your field. And when you're flying over your field, you're looking for the next thermal and basically you go thermal field, thermal field, and that's the way you do your cross country. Well, we do it over the flatlands, there's lots of fields. When you're in the mountains, you just gotta be a wee bit more selective. But as John rightly points out, you only need one field. Now, the other thing that really gets me is people, um, people um, don't realize the performance of their glider. It's, it's amazing. Uh, when you actually come to work it out. And um, basically, one of the sort of things you gotta do, or one of the things I think about, it sounds a bit dark, but I always like to know how high I am above the ground, uh, because that gives me an indication of how far I can glide. Now, obviously over the flatlands, it's only about 300 feet. You get into the mountains, can be up to three, three and a half thousand feet. And so the thing that I always think about is what is my cloud base of the terrain that I'm flying over? And again, you then have to turn around and say, I've got a certain amount of height that I'm going to need to plan my circuit. So to give this as an example, if the thermals, if we say flying over the mountains and the cloud base is 7,000 feet, right? Let's suppose the area which we're flying over is 2,000 feet up high. That means that you've got 5,000 feet to play with, right? But you need 1,000 feet for your circuit. So what you've actually got is 4,000 feet to glide. Now, if you take a glider like the GG300, Discus is slightly better performance, but you know, the uh, Libel's one in 36, so it's slightly less, Cirrus one in 38. You know, you take um, the Vega, that's Discus performance. So from 4,000 feet, right? So let's suppose that's over the flatlands, right? So over the flatlands, you've got to have a 5,000 foot cloud base, got a thousand foot for your circuit. So the flatlands, that's 4,000 feet that's usable. From 4,000 feet of gliding, you can glide 50 kilometers as near as damn it. So you only need one thermal to do your silver distance, in effect. 
You could glide 4,000 feet. You still got 1,000 feet. All you need is 0.6 of a kilometer to get your silver distance. That is the actual performance of your glider still at. And if you do it with a tailwind, so why aren't people not doing their silver distances more? You know, now the other thing is, is what amount of time? And you can't break it down into, oh, I've got a certain amount of brain capacity and all the rest of it. But how much of your thought process is concerned with landing or with soaring? And basically the point that I'm trying to make is that the lower you get, you divide the, the proportion of thinking about your field and thinking about soaring changes. Now, it's, it's not as simple as that because when you get a thermal, you're concentrating fully on the thermal, but in the back of your mind is the field. But you mustn't lose focus, particularly as you get lower. Um, the, you know, your uh, room for maneuver is more narrow. And so I think Kate put it quite well. How did you put it, Kate, when we were discussing this? Well, how do you make, you know, how do you use? Well, I, I just said when, when I'm, I've always got a field. And if I drift out of reach of one field, I pick another field. And even if I'm quite high, I know where my field is. And as I get low, I just think, can I still easily land in that field? And as long as I can still easily land in that field, I concentrate 100% on the thermal. And I just check every now and then, can I still easily land in that field if I have to? Yes, concentrate on the thermal. Yeah. I think that just about sums it up. I, I, I really do. But just to carry on with this, this, this um, uh, business. I mean, if you actually got 4,000 foot, 5,000 foot, you, you know, if you've got 4,000 foot usable, 1,000 foot per circuit, 50 kilometers, let's just go through that. See 3,000 feet, so 4,000 foot cloud base, you can glide 37 kilometers, 20 miles. So you only need two thermals with, with, uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, a 4,000 foot cloud base to do the silver distance. 2,000 feet, 3,000 foot glide base. You know, 24 kilometers. And 1,000 feet or above the ground, you can glide 12 kilometers. But the point I'm making is, is as well as, as to your decision making, it depends on what your priorities are. Um, and I think that I'd like to bring John and, uh, and, and Tony in on this. Are you with us, John? I think you have to unmute yourself if you're there, John. Oh, there you are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What points just, do you want to make about this? Just done it. Well, I, I was actually on a slightly different line. Um, you were talking about concentrating uh, at, on on the key thing at the key moment. Yeah. What's in my mind is that every flight has at least one difficult bit. And if you're into rock climbing, every rock climb has a crux somewhere or other. If you can deal with that, the rest is usually easy. So a key skill for a soaring pilot is to work out when your full concentration is really needed. If you've got to do a long flight, you cannot concentrate fully for the whole time. Knowing when to really work it, this next bit is critical. Uh, then uh, my internet may be failing here. Uh, we can still hear you, audible, John. Sam? Yeah, you're still there. Okay. Yeah, carry on. So, so a key, key thing is working out where the real crunch point is in your flight. Um, knowing that it's happening allows you to concentrate on, uh, on the flying absolutely 100% at a key moment. Even better is predicting when the difficulty is going to come and preparing for it in a way that it doesn't become a difficulty. So the more skill you get and the more experience you get in this, the more chance you've got of managing the really tough bits, the crux where, where it really matters in advance. Um, and 
as much as I fly, that skill is one that is more and more critical to me. What bit really matters? That's an iffy bit of sky ahead. There's a lot of overcast. If I can get through there, the sun on the ground beyond it, then that bit will be okay and I can relax and we can soar along at cloud base. But it's spotting the bit where it really, really matters. And that applies not just for the mountains, but for any form of soaring. Uh, you know, there are times when you really have to concentrate on, on what you're doing. Jo uh, Tony, what, what comments would you make about this? We were talking about this earlier today. Yeah, I tend to use a kind of, um, I suppose, a sequential filing system in the sense that I uh, kind of echoing Kate's approach, whereby if you're coming into a broad area, I will pick, get the landing field sorted out. If I've got two or three landing fields or whatever, then that gets filed away and not forgotten, but it's put to the back of my mind. And then the issue becomes obviously cloud selection, route selection and so on and so forth. Trying to pick the one that looks like it's you know going to be the easiest or the most probable, being prepared to make deviations. And then when you encounter lift, you just totally flow into that almost becoming i'm not saying unconscious this echoes a conversation that Sant and i were having earlier on in the day but i just really immerse myself in the process of thermally and just occasionally out the corner of the eye you flip back up the landing fields are over there and you flip round just in case there's some character in a power plane or whatever coming through your thermal without seeing you but essentially you are totally focused and I have a little motto, which might sound a little bit strange to some of you guys. It's something I kind of taught myself in para paragliding where it can be a bit rough on occasion. Um, it's, I, I try to say to myself, fly the air, not your thoughts about it, and not your thoughts about yourself. In other words, and this might, this is a bit of a probably sound odd, you don't think about your survival or your risk levels, because if you do, you won't fly the thermal very well. But, and also, let's be honest, all the theories we read about thermaling, they're all a little bit not quite there. So you try, or what's going on in the air? So you try and feel what's going on. And you, you, I hope you're understanding or begin to understand what I'm trying to say here. So I'm not, there's so much stuff. I mean, one of the things that, again came up in our conversation there's, there's a lot of stuff here and i have to say for me and i suppose it's about experience to a certain extent i'm not actually thinking about that much just when I'm, uh, I, I put certain things in a box i get them all sorted and then i get on with what i consider to be the primary task which is finding lift and moving on and when i'm actually thermaling i'm totally Thermally. Good. That's probably it, really. Yeah, no, that's great. And it, yeah, in a certain sorry. way, it comes back to situational awareness. Sorry, were you going to? Yes, totally good. Yeah. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, I mean, the, the point I was going yeah, to make. Sam, one, one... Are you breaking up, I'm afraid. What, one question, Sam. Ah, forget it. Forget it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I, gonna... I think I might have been muted earlier on. Somebody's flagged up that I wasn't there. I'm just saying when you were talking about situational awareness, that's pretty much how I approach it. Really important. Really important situational awareness. It's it's a lovely definition if you think about it. It's a beautiful definition. I was reading it and I thought it's just excellent. Anyway, we'll move on because uh, it's quarter two. We've, we've gone 45 minutes. And I've really got to talk about this. And I've got to bring Kate in uh, on this as well uh, because she's going to present some photographs. But, you know, when we look at, when we look at uh, the, uh, you know, soaring, uh, I've really got to talk about this, is, is that, um, let me just get my pointer again, if I can get it. We've got this whole area that we use 
flat lands that we use and leave inside the Oak Hills and the Sidlows, pretty good landable areas. But unfortunately, the thermals, we spoke about soaring down south, uh, and unfortunately, the thermals on the flatlands tend to be not as good as they are in the mountains. Just no two ways about it. But that's where most people do their thermal soaring, but it's not the best of conditions. And also, we don't get the weather that people do get down south. And so we're learning in a poor environment, a poor thermal rich environment. It's not that bad, it's not, you know, it's not that bad, but you really can build up a lot of experience down south and then apply it back here. And basically you've got these entry points or these entry routes into the highlands, right? So if you're from a Boyne, that whole area up here is fine and you use the D Valley to explore and you go left and right over the high ground on the plateau areas that we've spoken about. Here's Glen Clover, which you can go up and again, and you've just got to jump across. And I've spoken about jumping across from here and there's all fields up here, but there's these entry points and you can fool your way. And one of the things I always say is rather than setting tasks, you just follow the lift. And you just, as I was explained earlier, you pick a field and you say, okay, that's my base. And you've got a certain radius that you can fly from it. And you go off. One of the things about, it's not a bloody endurance test, this thermal soaring or anything like this. It's meant to be fun, right? When I wrote that, uh, my initial thing about me soaring over Sheer Hallion, I mean, that flight only lasted about three or four hours. But that flight sticks in my mind for the rest of my life watching that cloud over Sheer Hallion. It was just such a delight. And I mean, I mean, and all the time I'm within gliding distance of the field, of, of fields in the A9, I didn't have any problems at all. And it was just the sheer beauty of flying in the mountains. It's not a matter of setting a task that you've got to do. It's a matter of getting into the hills and experiencing the sheer delight of the powerful conditions that you can have in, in the hills. And you just fill your way in. I'm just going to go and play in the mountains today. I'm going to go up the A9, or I'm going to just go up to Creef and just look at the fields there and all the rest of it, and, and so on. And it's, you know, and you gradually build up the experience to then be able to do, to, to be, then be able to do the big flights. But you're not going in there to, as an endurance test. You're going in there because it's bloody good. And at that point, we'll, well, I'll just go on to the next slide, right? Because um, uh, I do want to bring Coach in. And again, you don't have to do big cross countries. You can use what you've got is you've got the, uh, you've got the, the Oak Hills here. And basically the trouble is Port Moak's in a bit of a bowl and the thermals tend to start on the Oak Hills. And, and then it eventually starts working at, at, at Port Mo. But what I normally do is I, you know, we're talking about winches. Winches, if there's not much wind, you've got one shot at it. Whereas you get an aero tow, you get towed to where the lift is, right? And what I do, because I can't wait for the uh, thermals to kick off at uh, Port Mo, is I'll take the tow to the Oak Hills and it can be two and a half thousand feet and I'll play around there. And then I work my way up here and the cloud base is increasing usually as we go up here. And again, for the Sidlows as well. And you use them as ladders to go into the mountains. And basically, there's two really good ways of going in, is it, which is up the uh, Oak Hills or up the Sidlows. If it's a good day, you can go straight across. But this, you know, it depends on how much rain there is, all the rest of it, right? All the normal shit that you can read up in books about. So you get to this area here, and then you can shoot off in whatever direction you wish to do. So these are the entry routes, and that's the way you've got to think about it. And you have a look, you know, and, and if you've got your database and all this sort of stuff, you just have, to have a play. And the point that I'm making or what I'm coming to is that this area here, this is the easiest area going up the A9, but this area here is particularly beautiful. It's the Trossets. And I think I'll bring you in at this point, Kate, if you want to take over control and bring up your pictures of, uh, 
of, of, of a flight you yeah, did sure. in, in, in the Oak Hills. If you, yeah. if you just leave that, that one up for a minute, um, yeah. Sant, um, because yeah, I, uh, Sant asked me to talk about this, just a, a very, this is aimed yeah, sure. at people at my kind of level. Um, I'm not an expert, there's lots of experts here, but I'm not one of them. But this is aimed at people who are just starting at this and to show that it really is, if you get a good day, <laughs> that is crucial. It's really quite easy and it is, breathtaking so I just want to describe a flight I did last year it was um early May I think April and May are the are the really good times um and Sant talked earlier about short and long-term planning and I, I'm not very good at these things and I wasn't very well planned and other people were doing enormous flights these day this day um and I didn't I did a comparatively small flight I'll show you at a moment but it's still one of my favorites because it was just such a glorious day and I had such wonderful views and the the bit of long-term planning I suppose I had done was that the glider was ready to go I took off at about midday I think and I was winching and I suddenly realized it was quite a good thermal day <laughs> and I thought oh damn I should go somewhere um, so I went back and I went around Port Moak caravan site because it's always worth doing a start even if you haven't declared and I tried to get away and I fell out and I went back and it took me a couple of goes to get across to the Ockels where, as Sant said, it tends to be good. And during that first part, when you're stretching the rubber band, what I do is I've got my moving map set to tell me what height I'm going to get back to PCS at. And if that starts getting a bit low, I go back and I like gain height locally and then I go off again. So. On the second attempt, I got across to the Oak Hills, and now I just want to bring up my screen. Uh... Right, so my bandwidth is terrible at the moment, but I hope people can see that. This is a picture of um, at the end of the Oak Hills, the West End, in fact. So what you do is you get across to the Oak Hills, and it, it is fairly intimidating, thermaling over this sort of terrain, but you thermal at the edge of them, if you're me, not right over the middle, at the edge where you are always within easy reach of loads of fields on the flat land beside them. But you thermal over the over the hills because that's where the thermal better. Then you get to the end of the Oak Hills, which is where we are here and we're looking, that's looking north. <coughs> um, Earn Valley is here and Creef is over there. And you're suddenly faced with flatlands again. And by this time, you've got into the mindset of, you know, this is a cracking day. And you can see it was a cracking day, very light wind and a 6,000 foot cloud base. And you've now got into the mindset that what I want is hills. And you're faced with these flatlands ahead of you. And you have a choice. You can either go left towards the Campsie Fells or you can go... Uh, you can double back over over here towards to do the 100k triangle. I thought about that because you don't have to declare that. And I'd have got far more ladder points if I'd done that. But I've done it before, so I didn't want to do that. So you look ahead and you see this is Loch Fenneker and Calendar. And that's going slightly to the right. If you remember Sant's picture, that was the entry route to the, to the slightly northwest that he showed. And it's taking us over towards the Trossachs here. And as you can see, there's loads of fields on the way there. So you just carry on a bit further. You've got loads of fields and bags of height. You know, I can, as Sant said, I can easily glide 50 kilometers from where I am at the minute. Here's Loch Venneker and I'm starting to look ahead and I'm just, all I'm doing at the moment is thinking, this is nice, where shall I go next? And if you've got a good day and you're reasonably okay at thermaling and you can, you know, you're reasonably confident that you can land in any of these kind of fields, then, this is not difficult. <laughs> um, so I've decided to push on a bit. Now that looks a little bit of intimidating, but behind me is the flatland, just right behind me, almost under me. So I'm not intimidated here, even I. Uh, that's like Lubnig over here. I've got Ben Vorlich and Stuka Crone. Um, uh, over this way, further north, that looks intimidating to me. I'm not going that way. I'm just sort of, at this point, wondering what shall I turn? And I decided about here, in fact, I decided you, you can't see what I was looking at ahead, but I could just get a glimpse of Loch Lomond. And I thought, right, let's go there, just somewhere to give up. 
something to turn. So I choose Loch Lomond Tarbert. And here is Ben Lomond, which is a beautiful hill. I've climbed it several times and it's really nice to see it from a different view. And in we go. And that's one of my favorite gliding pictures. It was just so glorious to be there. It's just a cracking day. Uh, that's Loch Lomond Tarbert. Interestingly, the only time I actually lost a lot of height was when I became goal oriented. <laughs> Sam could probably tell me where I'm going wrong here. It's an experience, I'm sure, where I started concentrating on getting to the goal instead of reading the sky and just going where the, where the clouds look best. And I actually lost quite a lot of height going in. But fortunately, as you can see, I had bags of height, so it didn't matter. And here we are coming out. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out is there's a perfectly good field just right there. It's, it's not even on um, Phil's database, I, I checked, but um, because it's all of this area is actually landable and you could just glide out anywhere across there, as long as you're careful not to go into the um, control zone, which is that, that's the campsies that I talked about that are in the control zone near enough. Oh, and incidentally, I should have said the other thing to be careful about is the um, airspace over your head on a day like this as you come out to the west. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, that's about it really. Um, as I was over here, I was, what I was thinking about partly was a beautiful winter's day in snow that I had climbing that mountain and I was just tracing the route and it was, you know, I just thought this is just, it's good to be alive, to be in this sort of situation. Um, and whoops. Yeah. So I turned my turning point. I did look over to the north. To me, that looks scary. You can see the sky is brilliant. And to be honest, and this is another point I was going to make, if I'd been in a K8, I'd have gone over there because in a K8, I can land anywhere. I can land in any of these teeny weeny little fields that lurk up every, up every valley. In my 18 meter glass ship with a minimum approach speed of 60 knots, I'm a little bit too cautious <laughs> because even though I've got an engine, it might, you know, I never rely on that. And so I've got to be sure personally that I can land. And it's, people say, oh, a K8 is rubbish for going cross country, but on a light wind day like this, it would be a dream. You would just be able to go over there and know that you could land anywhere you wanted. And you wouldn't need to because all of these clouds are booming. So, uh, and yeah, it's, it's just to show you how, what a nice day it was really. Um, that's it. The, the whole thing, as I say, it wasn't really planned. It wasn't declared. I didn't get many ladder points, um, but it just took me just over two hours there and back. Um, and it was just a lovely thing to do at lunchtime. I got back and had lunch afterwards. I think so, that's brilliant, Kate. I, th I think that's brilliant um, because you said right at the beginning, um, you know, you know, that people were going off in, uh, you know, doing big cross countries and all this sort of stuff. But that, that really is not the point. That really is not the point. The point is, is you go off and you have a beautiful day. You have a beautiful day. And from the point of view of, uh, uh, you know, from the point of view of, uh, you know, personal satisfaction, those are things that that live in your, your memory forever. And that's what's important. That is what soaring's about. It's uplifting, you know, and, and, and that's what it's all about. And I think we're gonna finish there because um, I mean, we, as usual, we're gone over time, but I, I thought that was really good, Kate. Um, any comments? John, what would you have to say about that? Yes, Sam, just while Kate was talking, the, the beauty of the flight we talked about last week, and it's one of the real things that makes me want to do it. But, but I have another problem that, that's getting in the way of satisfaction and flying. And more and more on, on a really good day, I find myself worrying that Zed's going to score more points than me. <laughs> and I'm just wondering whether Zed could give us any, can, can give me any advice on how to manage that. Are you there, Zed? Are you there, Zed? No, I don't think, I'm just looking through the list. No, he's not. What about Brian? Are you there, Brian? 
Mm-hmm. Are you there, Brian? Can you hear me? Now? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, go on, Brian. You've got comments which you like to make. Yeah, I mean, the flights I tend to remember, the competition flights, I've had some great flights in the mountains, but not that many. Um, so it's competition flights I remember most, I think. Um, on the bit about looking for fields, I was thinking, um, you know, if you're over decent terrain, once you know the fields are okay below, depending what time of year it is, because I think May's not a good time for early cross countries. You've got to be very wary of fields in May. Um, you know, if you're in August or September in Scotland, most of the fields are cut, so you don't really have to worry much about field landings until you get fairly low. Problem is, if you're thinking about a field landing after every, every thermal, you'll be in a field soon. So it's, yeah, just getting the right compromise. Tony, thanks, Brian. Tony, any any comments? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo Brian's, obviously, um, from what I said earlier on. But in terms of case fly, I, I, I wish I could do that. Uh, I have to say, I have, I don't know whether it's the years of competitions or whatever, but the notion of enjoyment to do with gliding, I mean, is, is anthropologically <laughs> um, You know, as, as you, some of you heard, you know, with that thermal flight I did, I don't know when, back when, you know, um, I was constantly thinking everybody else was doing better than me. So therefore I had to break every rule that I promulgated in a previous talk and and go for it. And, you know, until the results go up, I'm, I'm a, not a nervous wreck, but, you know, stupid. And I tell you, I've just gotten into road cycling and it's with this, there's a Strava app where you can compare your performance with other people. And I'm at the same game again. It's uh, terrible. You know, an old codger, I'm still trying out there, you know, push it, push it, must push it. So if anybody's got a cue for this, I'd be very, very interested to talk to them. Um, but and I really loved what you were saying, Kate, and the pictures you took. And uh, yeah, I wish I could do that. Shall we open it up to some say. questions now? Shall we open it up to some questions? I mean, if anybody wants to go and have a wee or whatever, you know, but oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've got a drink here. Um, so uh, anyway, so any questions? I can't, I don't have chat on mine, unfortunately, Kate. All right. Uh, I've got the chat so I can relay questions if I just bring up the window. Uh, Right, I think these were early. I, I can't see any. Uh, oh, uh, Matt has a suggestion for <laughs> for Tony. I think bromide. <laughs> <laughs> bromide in your tea. <laughs> um, right, question from Kath for Sant and Phil. How did you escape from the hill so quickly on Monday? Yeah, we all wondered that because by the time everybody else launched, it was rubbish. Well, we were jammy. Um, <laughs> we were jammy. Uh, we just, uh, there was a cloud. Uh, oh, don't ask me how it all works, because uh, I mean, we're talking wave soaring here. Um, there was a cloud overhead, the, uh, the, the ridge. And um, it wasn't actually, uh, what you get is if you think of a, if you think of a, a ship going through water, it has a V-shaped weight. And uh, um, that was the uh, type of wave that I thought it was. And, um, and basically, literally, we both just went straight off the ridge into the wave. And it wasn't aligned across the wind. It was lined at about 45 degrees. And we sort of made our way at about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 feet. And then it just so happened that the wave started to set up at, um, at Glen Farg. And so you had this diagonal wave, and then you could see a, a wave start, just puffy clouds to start to form over Glen Park. And Phil had set um, Glen Park as his start point, and I was pissed off with that because my start point was Perth, and there was a wave bar over Perth. But from Phil's point of view, he had a perfect star because the wave just went on and just carried on to the wave bar at Perth. So that's how we got away. I think Dougie got away as well, and Tony got away later. 
Um, but uh, no, we were just lucky, which is the important thing about early morning launches. You know, you got to be there, and you got to be with the conditions. And even at the least, even at the least, if it's not working first thing in the morning, and it is forecast to work, it will work at some point or another. But my attitude is, don't waste the opportunity. Be ready. Bill, would you like to comment on that? Because you were there. Yeah, the reason, I got, the reason I got away anyway is that this above my head is a halo. It's not a downlight, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was, I think it was just pure luck, and uh, timing. Yeah, we were, we were just there. We were just there at the right time. It was, it was, it was perfect timing. Yeah. yeah. Right. Next question. Uh, when will this damn virus be over? <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think people are out of questions. Okay. Well, I think what we're going to do is Phil's doing a lecture on the Tepigram um, on December the 14th. And I think we'll do one more of these. And what we're actually sort of, what we'll do or what we'll attempt to do is I'll just carry on about you know terrain a little bit but we'll actually go into how we interpret how what the weather's going to do and how we actually plan tasks um, to take into account the thermal conditions because one of the sort of things that uh, I find is is that thermal thermal conditions are quite variable um it does change throughout the day and uh there's always in particularly in scotland there's always these influences going on like valley effects you know where the sea air you know if it's really good in the mountains the air gets sucked in from the sea uh if the wind's less than 10, 10 knots and they tend to go up the valleys and things like that so um there's all these strange effects that you can get that are both pluses and minuses um and I think we'll just discuss the sort of, you know, how you plan and how you deal with the uh, with the thawing conditions. Um, and I think that'll be the last one on, uh, um, you know, thermally. So elaborate on your thermal routes into the mountains a wee bit more, and then talk about the, you know, actually how you sort of think, what am I going to do with the day? But as Kate points out, just shooting into the mountains and admiring the view, bloody brilliant. Right, with that, unless there's anything else. Well, there's uh, a few questions about where's a good site down south, and there's several answers to, to go and practice thermaling. People are suggesting Husbors, Nymphsfield, Millfield. Uh, Millfield, uh, I think I'd say about Millfield. No, I wouldn't say Millfield is. It's too close to see. Um, I'd say uh, Husbors, Nymphsfield, Nymphsfield's. <laughs> The thing about Nim, I, I was I was tug pilot at Nimsfield. The thing about Nimsfield is it's not actually that brilliant because uh, it's too close to the sea. I think Lasham, without a doubt, Osbos, anything that's in land, or uh, Hocklington uh, is another one, um, although a bit far north. Uh, but I'd say Husbos, Bosla. You just have to look at uh, what's been done this year, thermaling down south. Uh, it's been a lot. It's been cracking down south this year. And uh, I really do recommend going down south. Okay, next question. Uh, there's just a lot more comments about that. Uh, Bruce is saying to too much airspace at Lasham. Yeah, true. that's true. Yeah, Bidford. Yeah, um, I was suggesting the join the club expedition because that's always great fun. Yeah, it is. I, I, and you're within a peer group, if you see my point. You've got mutual support. Whereas if you just go down on your own, you're a bit alone, if you see my point. Good for a gang of you to go down. And Adrian is saying go to the other sites in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, Feshi is lovely for thermaling. Oh, can... Feshi's, Feshi's really worth a trip in the summer. It's fantastic, beautiful site. Just a privilege to fly from there. The Boyne's very good. The Boyne's very good as well. We've got all these sites in Scotland. So, yeah, I mean, as John pointed out earlier, Dumfries. Anything anybody would like to add before we shut up then?
Yeah, 14th of December for Phil's talk. Uh, Sant, what do you think about Hus um, not Hus Boys? I was there for six years, but um, the Long Mend was quite an interesting place. Ah, oh, well, that's it. You, you get know. bungees there. Yeah. Yeah, I that's an interesting one. place. Yeah, that's a beautiful site. Yeah, that was quite good for our early cross country. Yeah. We did, we did lead yeah, no, that's good, Dave. Yeah, good point. Follow there. Yeah. The bungee was a wee bit disappointing because it's so slow. <laughs> I thought it was going to be catapulted like a. Is a it? Car I, I'd love to do one. I have strong wind, so it just rolls off the hill. But it's good fun. Good. Right. Well, we're, oh, and we're... somebody's just pointing out 14th of December is when Pete Stratton is doing, for anyone who missed or couldn't get into last night's talk, he's doing another one on the 14th of December. Well, we just make it the day after then, but it'll be around then. Oh, hang on. No, Phil's got something on then. We'll, we'll, we, will, we will sort it out. It'll, there'll yeah. be a date in December. Uh, and I'll sort out a date for the next talk as well, depending on what the BGA is doing as well. Okay. Right, how long will we be going? One hour ten. Last week was one hour fifteen. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Right. Um, I'll say good night, and uh, we'll all uh, see you again in, a, in about ten days, two weeks. I hope that was uh, okay. Cheers for now. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thanks. thanks. So what do 